Hello, everyone. We'll get started with the session. I'm Bill Gemutler from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm chairing the first half of the session where we have a long talk. Before we start the talk, uh, we wanted to let you know that outside there is a book uh, in, in Seth uh, Teller's name. If you'd like to um, sign or put, put notes in, um, it's by the wall against the registration desk. Uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, Maya Chakma from the University of Washington. Uh, she's going to talk about robot programming by demonstration with interactive action, action visual, visualizations. All right. Hello, RSS. Uh, my name is Maya Chakma. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington. And today I'm presenting a project I started while I was a postdoc at Willow Garage uh, about a year ago, uh, working with Kaijan and Leila. Um, and my student Sonia at UW has been pushing forward since last fall. Uh, unfortunately, she couldn't be here uh, because she's pregnant, she couldn't travel. Uh, so I get to do one last conference talk. Um, so our work is motivated by the idea of general purpose robots that can be programmed by their end users in the context of use, so after they've been deployed. Um, so why are we interested in this? Uh, well, firstly, we don't want to limit what these robots will do for people. Uh, if someone has a creative way they can use these robots, uh, we just want to let them do that. Um, and secondly, we don't want to restrict how these things are done. So even if we can be sure that a certain functionality is very desirable for a large population, uh, every user will have certain preferences about uh, how they want things done. And finally, we believe that this actually simplifies the engineering challenge. So rather than trying to build robots that can do everything in every possible deployment scenario, uh, the problem for a particular robot is reduced to doing a few things in a particular context. And we can actually already do this today. Uh, so all of the demos of PR2 that you have seen probably many videos of is exactly that. It's a few things in a particular context. Um, so the problem with this is that you actually need many man hours of highly skilled people uh, to be able to do this. So we know that it's possible today, but the solution we have is not scalable. So our approach is to try to make the end users themselves uh, program the robots. Um, so when we say this, we don't actually mean that we will teach them ROS. Uh, we actually would like to make it much easier for them to be able to do this. Um, and in fact, this is, this is done in many other domains. Uh, there is actually a whole research area called end-user programming. This is at the intersection of programming languages and uh, human-computer interaction. Um, so you might actually not realize very simple ways in which people program, quote-unquote, program every day. Uh, the, the canonical example is spreadsheets. Uh, another very common one is uh, doing web pages. Um, and actually, uh, even when you go to your phone and change some settings, in some very restricted terms, you're programming it. So you're, you're actually making it behave differently from uh, everybody else's phone. Um, so there are many different techniques for end-user programming. Uh, but the one that has been most popular in robotics is programming by demonstration. Uh, so the idea there is that uh, you can demonstrate the behavior that uh, you want uh, from the robot multiple times. The robot learns a model of the behavior and then can later reproduce this behavior based on the model. This is an example from our previous work where demonstrations are pr provided kinesthetically by physically moving the robot and by giving some simple speech commands. So the way that the robotics community has adopted this approach is not so much like an end user tool. So rather we see it used for problems where it's even for the programmer, it's hard to sit down and write a program, and demonstrating just uh, is, is much easier. So this makes a lot of sense, but uh, as a result uh, of this focus, uh, the trend has been to push uh, this towards very challenging tasks. So we come up with things that are uh, more difficult for the robot than it could be. Um, and uh, these are not necessarily directly useful for scenarios for where robots are assisting people or doing some kind of service task. And one criticism is that I think uh, in, in this line of work, the, the evaluation has been with very few skills. So I feel like if, if we're claiming that the robot is learning, I want to see it do many different things. 
Um, and some of you might know that a lot of my thesis work was aimed at addressing some of this, these limitations uh, from a user perspective. Uh, in particular, I did a number of user studies that involved people teaching robots, uh, and basically to try to understand uh, the challenges we might have, and also develop some techniques to address these, like having the robots ask questions as the ro uh, after the person gives demonstration. Um, for this particular paper, uh, we, we basically had several objectives that, that, we were, uh, that were motivated by some of the empirical findings from doing a lot of user studies, uh, but also some of the uh, criticism of, um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we wanted to focus on programming basic skills that uh, are use that give something useful to people and evaluate with lots of different actions. And we actually wanted to build a robust system that we can just continue using, you know, even after this paper is over and accumulate lots of robot actions over time. Um, and secondly, we didn't want users to have to provide many, many demonstrations. This was suggested empirically over and over that people don't just don't want to repeat. Um, and we wanted our system to allow users to have an accurate mental model of what was going on. So let me explain this uh, thing about mental models a little bit. Um, so consider the scenario, the person provides uh, demonstrations to the robot, the robot forms a model based on multiple demonstrations, and then uh, executes in a new context based on the model. Um, so generally, this model is a black box for the user. So they don't know what's going on inside. Uh, if something is wrong with it, um, and you know you can trust me that something will go wrong, definitely. Uh, the only way that the person can detect this is from the robot's execution. So the, the user basically needs to do a lot of tests to make sure that in the future uh, the robot is going to do the right thing. So the first thing that we are saying in this work is let the user see this. Uh, so for this, the idea is to provide the user visualizations of the action that has been programmed so far and adapted over time. But still, even if the person knows exactly what's wrong uh, with the model, the only way they can fix it is provide more demonstrations. Uh, so this, this might be a very indirect way of fixing a problem that they see uh, that they exactly know. Um, so instead, we're saying, uh, let the user edit the model directly. So this is what uh, basically interactive, what we call interactive visualizations in this paper. Now, of course, all of these depend strongly on what model you are using. Um, so obviously, you cannot do this with every model. Uh, so we have some important requirements about the model that we're using to represent actions um, that are being taught. So the first is these need to be visualizable, and they need to be intuitive for people. They need to be simple enough for people to understand what's going on. And they need to be, it, need to it needs to make sense to, uh, uh, to directly edit these. Um, Again, this might not, not be possible for all models. And this is in addition to allowing uh, the programming of useful basic actions. So here's what we came up with. Uh, so basically, we re represent actions as a sparse sequence of keyframes, where each keyframe involves a six degree of freedom uh, and effective pose of the robot, a landmark that the pose is relative to, which is chosen from a list of available landmarks, uh, which by default has the robot origin, the robot uh, coordinate frame, and other landmarks in the environment represented by a pose, um, a landmark type, so we can have multiple types of landmarks, and a type-dependent descriptor for comparing uh, different landmarks. Um, and finally, the keyframe separately encodes the, the gripper state uh, as a discrete variable, open or closed. Uh, since the, our robot has two arms, we do this in parallel for two arms separately. So let me tell you how such actions are programmed, how it progresses over time. So the robot will first look around to detect and localize all the available landmarks uh, in addition to the origin. Uh, so we have candidate coordinate frames that the poses that we are going to save could be attached to. Then we will move the robot's arm uh, through the action that we want to demonstrate. And along the way, we will uh, save some poses as keyframes or toggle the state of the gripper, which are also saved. Um, and some of these poses will automatically be attached to some of the landmarks. And for this, we use a very simple heuristic, basically just distance. Um, uh, you can consider this as the landmarks having a sphere around them that if the pose is within that, it gets attached to it by default. 
And anything that's outside is considered absolute, so implicitly relative to the robot's origin. So very, very simple. Uh, so how does the robot execute uh, the actions that are represented this way? Uh, so first, it's going to accumulate the new set of landmarks. Uh, now it's a new, in a new scenario. Then for each landmark reference in the action, uh, it will find the corresponding current landmark so that it can actually move the poses relative to those. So it needs to do this registration problem, uh, solve this registration problem. For this, uh, we use a simple graph cut algorithm in this bipartite graph that involves all possible pairings. And the weight of the edges are uh, based on the similarity metric between uh, the landmarks. And only landmarks of the same type are compared to one another. And this goes on until all of them are assigned. And if some object didn't get assigned, uh, so there's a threshold on that, the robot says that it cannot execute because it couldn't find the relevant objects for the action. So finally, the poses are transformed, transposed into their new coordinate frames, and the robot uses an existing uh, motion planning technique to move through these poses and change the grip rate state, states accordingly. All right, so let's see uh, this with one example. This is stacking three cups. Um, the cups are the landmarks, so the robot, uh, before the demonstration, looks at the environment, segments them out, and uh, the descriptors for them is, again, very simple, uh, just the bounding box of the point cloud. So those dimensions are used for um, doing the matching. Uh, so you, let me show this again. Uh, you can see that I'm saving some poses, uh, some free grasp, grasp, and lift poses relative to the original pose of the two, two of the uh, cups. And I'm, I'm saving a drop pose uh, that's relative to one of the cups, which is the one that everything gets stacked onto. And you can see that you get a lot of generalization for free with this. So the cups can move around. Um, here's how we actually visualize these. Uh, this time it's a two cup stacking, but you can sort of see how the poses are represented and how uh, the relativeness is shown with some links. Now let's come back to users directly editing these action representations. Here are the edits that we allow. Uh, the first one is actually editing the pose of the keyframe. This is either by moving it in, uh, in the 3D world or actually moving the, the robot's arm to the pose that you want to move that keyframe. Um, another one is deleting a keyframe, simple. Uh, and the last one is changing the coordinate frame. And this is the one where we're expecting more errors to happen because we're using uh, the heuristic. Um, but all of these are very simple. Here's some examples of those. So here, uh, re changing the coordinate frame from the cup to the absolute. That was not meant to be attached to that object. And here's another one of actually directly editing the poses. Um, so basically, that's, that's the idea, to recap how you program. Basically, it starts with a single demonstration to sort of initialize uh, what the action is. Um, and then you, the user does some kind of editing. Uh, this can take some time. It usually involves uh, changing the coordinate frames that were not assigned the right way. Um, and finally, uh, at any point, uh, the robot can test the action. And as we go, you're starting to see some of the different actions. Um, so that's, our, that's how the system works. So now let me tell you a little bit about how we evaluated it. Uh, we did this in two ways. Um, we had a systematic evaluation to sort of demonstrate the expressivity of the different things you could do. Uh, and we, uh, we did a user study uh, to sort of validate that people could actually use uh, the system to program new actions. Um, as I said, the focus was uh, on object reconfiguration tasks. Um, so, so we wanted to demonstrate different types of object reconfiguration tasks being programmed this way uh, with our system. And this includes uh, transferring, so transposing objects, uh, changing their states, assembling and disassembling two objects, uh, and other multi-object arrangement tasks. And also we wanted to capture whether one or two arms were used uh, and whether the manipulation actually involved picking up the object or it was non-prehensile. Um, so we came up with this benchmark with, uh, uh, that had 12 tasks, 
that sort of captured the combination of these factors that I just mentioned. So let me show you some examples from that benchmark. I didn't put all of them. This is uh, assembly state change. Multi-object, this is two arm, take up and place. Disassembly. All right. Um, so this is uh, sort of how we measured uh, the generalization, so how we evaluated. Basically, after demonstrating and editing the task, uh, we moved the, the box around, uh, like the, the different landmarks that were in the environment around, and um, uh, two different initial configurations until we found five that uh, were actually possible for the robot to execute, so it wasn't out of the reach, and we recorded whether it was uh, successful or not. Um, and here are the results for the 12th task. Uh, overall, the actions generalized well, but usually there was one out of five that failed. So it's quite important to be able to detect failures. Um, and it's actually possible to, to find five that will succeed, or there are actions that will succeed in the, these five because our participants, some of our participants did better than uh, this author. Um, but we wanted to be honest in this, so we followed a strict protocol. And we saw that most failures were due to inaccuracies in localizing the, the landmarks um, when they changed the perspective. And um, basically also the fact that that localization didn't capture asymmetries or uh, uh, shapes of the object. Okay, so next we want to see that other people can also did it, do this. So we did a user study with 10 participants. This is not a control experiment, so it was a validation. Uh, we brought people to the lab and described them uh, the commands they could use and the different functionalities of the uh, visualization. This was the setup they had, uh, so the visualization was available to them like that. And then we described to them three tasks to be programmed. Uh, these were a, a subset of the benchmark, and then we just let them program. And we tell them to move on when uh, they can do as many tests and move on when they're uh, happy with it. So everyone was able to program all uh, three tasks. Uh, so this means uh, before moving on, they themselves saw it succeeding at least one time. Some of them tested it more. When we tested uh, their, the actions that they had programmed in five scenarios, similarly, uh, we saw that they, they did well overall. Uh, it was comparable to the expert in two of the cases. Uh, the one they had trouble with was one where they had to coordinate two arms. Um, but the key difference between experts and, and end users was uh, in the time they took to program these. So people might not get too much better at what they can do with it, but they'll definitely get much faster over time. And looking at subjective reports, uh, we observed that people made use of the visualization. So the, this ability to, to see what was going on was most used uh, based on their reports. Uh, but they were, all, they were overall very positive about the usefulness of editing uh, functionalities, but they didn't seem to be using it as much. Um, basically, they did fine with the, with the heuristic. And one thing we observed was they tended to uh, start over um, as opposed to edit uh, in some cases. Okay, so there are more results in the paper if you're interested, but uh, the main point from the evaluation was that uh, we introduced this large benchmark and provided some systematic evaluation to show that we could capture these uh, with our system. And we showed that people could do it too. Uh, but in addition to this, something that we don't really get to say in papers uh, is that we actually have been demoing this in many different venues uh, for more than a year. And, and different, basically, it, it kind of works, it really works. You can, uh, people come up with very interesting things to program and uh, it's fun to watch. Um, so I couldn't find too many videos, but I have a few. Uh, this is a PR2 owned by a very rich banker. Uh, this is in an uh, older adult care center. Uh, these were some experiments that I did uh, back then. The, some of them are actually in the benchmark, but you can see it be done with different objects. Um, and um, one thing I want to say is, um, oh, this is a regrasp. It's also very useful for regrasping. Um, so one thing I want to say, you might think that you know you've seen PR2 do, do these things uh, before, 
So I'd like to emphasize that our contribution is an approach that lets anyone program these things, not just you know, people who know ROS. And this do, do this in a particular environment with particular objects um, and uh, the way that they prefer it. So, of course, there are some limitations. Uh, the top three, in my opinion, were the perception of the landmarks, just uh, the localization being kind of coarse and the descriptors being uh, weak. Um, so we saw the, the, this localization error being a problem for the success. The descriptor we didn't see because we didn't really test with a lot of clutter. I think it would fail uh, pretty badly. Um, and um, the another one was that it was only sequential, so stacking three cups will only work with three cups. So Sonia is now working on developing this uh, to have loops and, and conditions. And finally, in gen more generally, um, I think of actions as sequences of constraints. And this was a very strict version of it, where the constraint was go exactly here. Uh, so I think more uh, relaxed versions will work better, uh, will provide more generalization. So that's it. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I think it's a very interesting and very pragmatic approach to learning yes. from demonstration, and it's shown that it's worked really well. I was wondering if you had thoughts on how this might work when you introduce obstacles in the environment. Do you, can you envision? Uh, the trajectory, sort of the interpolations that you're producing to be serve as initializations for a trajectory optimizer or something mm -hmm. like that? Yes, exactly. So uh, basically what, the, what we're getting from the user is these constraints. It's good that I just said that. Um, so it's sort of, you can take that as constraints for a motion planner that takes care of obstacles, is optimal, and so there, it's sort of plug and play a little bit. And it's a framework for getting that information from the user. Any other questions? Everybody's tired. I have a question. Um, how much do you think people had a hard time switching between the simulation and the actual world? Do you see or a mishmash of kind of an augmented reality version of that? Mm -hmm. Would that help? Right. Um, so I think that might have been the reason people didn't use the edits as much, because in their case, they were standing and they had to go. Uh, when you, if, if you saw me uh, at Willow Garage, I'm sitting there and just turning and back and forth. Um, so the augmented reality, though, it's, it's, you know, there's not enough modalities there. Um, so you need to simplify it. And I think one thought was, uh, you know, these bubbles around the landmarks, if you could actually know when you're in it and not, if you had this type of very simple feedback, uh, people would do the right thing. So they would, if they meant it, meant it to be relative, they would get it closer into the bubble. So simple feedbacks could help then program better in the first place. Yeah. Um, I've been involved in the development of a user interface similar to this, for, um, um, but I'm wondering, have you explored um, how you can in inject um, more complicated uh, planning information, for example, force-based information into this, or was that something you explored? Mm -hmm. um, you said force-based, right? Force-based or informing about kinematic I can't hear very well, so sorry. For example, um, in the pressing action. Ah, okay. Um, have you um, explored, thank you. Um, have you explored how to, how the user can inject that type of information or, and no. also closed loop kinematic chains beyond right, just right. kinematic um, sequences? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, so we haven't explored it and I think it's a great idea. So it's uh, basically, that's, that's something that's also difficult to demonstrate, you sort of, um, the robot needs to do it on its own to sort of sense what the right uh, exactly forces so. are. Um, but it's a great idea to have that as a thing. You can say that, you know, uh, so thinking again as uh, actions as general constraints, you could define some parts of it uh, as force constraints, like uh, go down until you feel a certain force, or like if you have a towel, pull it until you feel the, the back thing, as opposed to go exactly here. Right? So that could be something that users could define. Uh, I should say, though, that, that this is not something you can get a user and immediately tell them and expect to do the right thing. So I think 
as we make these programs more expressive and let people program things that are more sophisticated, we will need to be training them and uh, uh, they'll, they won't do it the first day that, that they're using it, but maybe over time, something like Photoshop, you know, you get to use uh, it uh, and use other functionality over time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker.